How's everybody today? Good to have everybody here today. And then we're going to talk about an, uh, if there's any obscure book in the Old Testament, it's the book of Habakkuk. But we're going to talk a little bit about what he said and how it applies to us in these days. It seems that we're born with a thirst to know. To, and the only way that we know how to quench our desire to know is to ask questions. We don't ever really lose the urge to ask questions. When we are young, we have questions like, why is the sky blue? And why does Debbie like to wear pink a lot? Why do I have to eat broccoli? When we get out older, sometimes our questions go deeper. They take on more urgency. And they're often asked out of a painful situation. When you read the Bible, you will find a lot of people asking big questions. A childless couple uh, facing an unfulfilled promise asks, will a son be born to a man 100 years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? The answer to that was yes. You can almost hear the desperation in the words, as Abraham expects the answer to be no. When everything else had fallen apart, his health, his family, personal fortune, when nothing was left for Job, he couldn't help but ask, your hands shaped me and made me, will you now turn and destroy me? Remember that you molded me like clay. Will you now turn me to dust again? Jeremiah, after being ridiculed by a priest, denounced by his family, rejected by his friends, having other prophets contradict him and laugh at him, he said, why was I even born? In the face of the storm that threatened their life, the disciples in that small boat find Jesus asleep and they wake him up and said, teacher, don't you care if we drown? If you look closely, you will notice something about these questions. One's asked in the face of unfulfilled promises or, or personal tragedy or some other difficult situation. Questions that, that are on our lips when difficult people try to steal our joy or when we are facing an imminent danger or even when we face undeserved punishment. When time gets, times gets tough, people start directing their questions at God, don't they? So, right in the middle of that tradition of questioning God here in the latter part of the Old Testament is this prophet Habakkuk. He's, he's, his work is different from every other prophet writing the history of Israel and Judah. What makes it different is he never says one word to another person except to God. The only person addressed in the book of Habakkuk is God. And Habakkuk, when God answers him back. Habakkuk has a few questions for God. The ones we read aren't the only ones, but there's some big ones. And he's not shy about asking God questions. The book opens with this frustrating question, how long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you intolerate it? Why do you tolerate wrong? The situation during Habakkuk's life was difficult. And as he looks around the world, the way his world was, the injustice, the pain, seemed to be just a natural part of his life. And, and he asked God why he doesn't do something. I'm sure you've felt that way. In the wake of a personal tragedy or when you're waiting for some good thing to happen and the only thing that keeps seems to keep happening is bad stuff. Have you ever just wanted to try to get God's attention? Just kind of wake him up? Come on, God. I'm dying here. Why don't you do something? Or 
this man named uh, Tim Hansel. He was about as active a person as anybody could be. He, he lived in Central California in the 1970s, and his passion was mountain climbing. I don't judge him for that. He loved it so much that, that he made his work leading mountain climbing expeditions. I don't judge him for that either. But one day, 1973, uh, around dusk, when the snow-covered mountain turned to ice, he fell, and he suffered an injury that would cripple him for the rest of his life. It wasn't that his back was broken so much, but that his spinal cord was damaged. He could still walk, he could still move around, but his spine was unalterably damaged, and every movement caused him excruciating pain. He said it was pain that was so intense that it shook him to the core of his being. He spent several years questioning God. Why did this have to happen to me? Why don't you take away the pain? And as you can imagine, the longer he lived with the pain, the more intense the questions got. Then after a couple of years, Tim's questions began to be answered. As, you read, as I read through his journal, uh, you can get glimpses into the answers that, that Tim was getting. In the winter of 1975, he, he wrote, perhaps this is the ultimate realization when we recognize that all questions have the same answer that comes from you, O oh Lord, from you. A few months later, in 1976, he wrote, at times, I whisper in the night, God, I've learned enough now. I'm ready for the next test. The next year, in the, uh, that, that summer, he wrote, learning patience, it takes a lot of patience. What a test of character adversity, what a test of character adversity is. It can either destroy or build up, depending on our chosen response. Pain, pain can make us either bitter or better. And then in the spring of 1978, he wrote, if your security is based on something that can be taken away from you, you will constantly be on the false edge of security. As, as I read through these, these struggles that he had, to find words that are parallel to those of Habakkuk, <laughs> I love trying to say that word. Habakkuk questioned why God let pain and evil continue on the earth. When God answers and explains that he is going to punish the wickedness of Israel by allowing the Babylonians to destroy the southern kingdom, Habakkuk isn't very satisfied. Now he struggled with why God would use the most ruthless and terrible people the infamous Babylonians to judge the Jewish nation, or at least, at least the Jewish nation was a little godlier than the Babylonians. And as you read through the text, you can't help but realize that Habakkuk didn't come to a conclusion that empowered him to move on. But he did decide to do something, and that was to praise God. He said in Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 19, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He will make me sure-footed as a deer and bring me safely over the mountains. What changed? That's my question. What changed between chapters, chapter 1 and chapter 2 and into chapter 3? He came to a realiz realization in chapter 2, when he wrote, the righteous will live by faith. These are the words that Paul talked about when he explained how to live as a Christian. He quotes the passage from Habakkuk in Romans 1.17, and the Hebrew author quotes it again in Hebrews 10.38. But this New Testament idea is rooted all the way back to the prophet back, the righteous shall live by faith. 
Righteous people live by faith. Next question is, what does that mean? It means that people who truly follow God trust Him enough to be obedient even when things in life don't make any sense. When you feel like you've been betrayed, remember the righteous live by faith. That means that you trust God enough to forgive like he tells you to forgive. When you watch somebody uh, uh, getting ahead by doing the wrong thing, remember the righteous live by faith. That means you don't do the same thing they are doing in order to catch up, but you continue to do what is right, knowing by faith that God will, will reward that obedience. When you see Christians or hear about Christians in a faraway land being killed for their faith, there's an overwhelming desire to wonder why that could ever happen. But remember, the righteous live by faith. They continue in their faith, even if it leads to physical death. When you're being controlled by a habit that is uncontrollable uh, to you, by you, remember the righteous live by faith. That means that you trust God enough that you know he will give you the strength to exhibit that self-control. So what are the struggles that you have in your life? You can think about that for a little bit. Let's take a lesson from Habakkuk. Let's, let's in, uh, let me encourage you to turn your struggles into questions. It's okay. Turn your struggles into questions for God. Sometimes I think many of us have been taught that it's impolite to ask God any question. It almost seems sacrilegious to question God, but we need, need to realize that, that it isn't true. Children don't ask their parents questions because they doubt them. They ask their parents questions because they believe mom or dad knows the answer. Of course, that period of time is usually followed by, I know more than my parents. I think it was uh, Mark Twain said something like, when I was 14, I couldn't believe how stupid my father was. When I was 21, I was amazed at how much he had learned in seven years. Young people, if those of you who think you know more than your parents, you know who you are. You know the ones who think they have it all figured out? You don't have it figured out. You really don't. Listen to your parents. They love and want the best for you. Little commercial in there. There are a lot of people who are right there with God, though. They don't ask questions because they believe that they know more than He does. I can't tell you how many people I've spoken with who believe God should be answerable to them instead of recognizing that they are answerable to God. But if we are people of faith, who want to live by faith, we are going to ask questions of God. We would do well in this, in this enterprise because we're in the company of people like Abraham, and Jeremiah, and Job, and disciples, even Jesus himself. Those who live by faith have enough trust to know that God has the answers to these tough questions that they aren't afraid to ask. James tells us, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. There's been a number of times in my life that I've gone to God with a bunch of questions. 
time for, to explain all of those, but I'll explain one time. In June of 1999, right near my first day, as a matter of fact, my mother, who was 86 years old, broke her hip. She was, and two days later, my brother, who was one of my favorite people in the entire world, died alone in a hotel room in the city where my mother was in the hospital. A cremation was, was planned for him, but my mom wanted to see him before that was done. But she was in the hospital with a broken hip. And in dire medical circumstances, two paramedics volunteered to take her to the funeral home in an ambulance. It was probably one of the most giving gestures I've ever seen. And I'll never forget sitting in that funeral home with the body of my giant of a brother. He was, he was over two meters tall, six foot five and a half. And his body was laying there just on a table, not even in a casket. It was, it was surreal. There was no music, no funeral type of atmosphere. It was my mom's oldest, and she had seen her other, other two sons die tragically, one by suicide and one by alcoholism. And I remember feeling the incredibly unfair nature of this whole situation. It wasn't right. It was as wrong as anything could be. There was about 20 of us there that day, but the focus was on mom. She was really having a difficult, difficult struggle. And as she sat there in that wheelchair, it was almost uh, as if you could see the memories that were running through her mind. She was just 17 years old when my brother was born. And it was almost like they grew up together. Uh, she was beautiful in those days, young and, and full of talent and promise. Of course, I wasn't part of her life in those years, but I know some of those memories were really grand, full of life, and I know that there was tragedy and turmoil too. It was one of those moments where you're transfixed, where you've changed. Where, uh, where things happen. And even though many of the choices that my brother made weren't right, he was an inspiration to others. And uh, he was always one of my heroes, he always will be. A good part of who I am, strangely enough, was put in place on that day. They weren't especially good times for Debbie and me either. We were both in a ministry, but not being used to any great potential. And in reality, neither one of us was living by faith. I was learning, learning what it looked like on the other side of the pulpit. And I was still fairly angry and not understanding the path that we were on. But in all of that, God never chastised me for all the questions. I found out that he's secure enough to not be offended by questions. That's not always true for people, but it is for God. My realization came slowly. God is not insecure. So he doesn't fear questions. He simply wants us to know that he knows the answers. That's part of living by faith. I look back on those painful years now and, and I realize that I learned a, a whole lot more <laughs> and a few valuable life skills and a different perspective on church during that time. Those years probably 
teach me more from hindsight probably than, than, at, uh, than they did at the time. But I've come to realize that God is not the one who snaps his fingers immediately to fix difficult situations. That's just me thinking. But I think it's borne out by what Habakkuk says. There's something valuable in the painful process of overcoming life's difficulties. And it would be lost if God magically took care of every painful circumstance. Paul wrote in Romans 8, a verse that I've clung to in very difficult times. And we know that God causes everything to work together for those, for, together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. We should never end there. Remember, verses are arbitrary. Chapters are arbitrary in the Bible. There's no magic there. Because the next verse said, For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Don't get lost in the big ideas here. The verse simply tells us, that God is using things that happen in this life to remake us into the image of Jesus. And how in this world do we think we would ever become like Jesus if we didn't suffer and endure pain? Jesus' life was marked by pain and rejection. The culmination of that pain and rejection was the cross that ended his human life and ministry. Now, I can't help but notice, too, that as the perfect life of the Son of God was coming to an end, even he had a question on his lips. Anybody remember what that question is? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, I can't say I understand all of the implications of that question, but I do know this. It wasn't a question that lacked faith. Because I know his last words were, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. There will be, uh, there will be, there will be, there is no doubt in, uh, that there will be times in life when most of us will question why God allows certain things to happen. My encouragement to you is that during those times, instead of retreating from God and thinking that you know his answer, join with Habakkuk and Jeremiah and Abraham and the disciples and even Jesus himself. Struggle through those painful times with the kind of faith that keeps asking questions. But in the end, join with Habakkuk in the words that he closes his book with. You marched across the land in anger and trampled the nations in your fury. You went out to rescue your chosen people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the heads of the wicked and stripped their bones from head to toe. With his own weapons, you destroyed the chief of those who rushed out like a whirlwind, thinking his, Israel would be easy prey. Trampled the sea with your horses and the mighty waters piled high. I trembled when I heard this. My lips quivered in fear. My legs gave way beneath me and I shook in terror. I will wait quietly for the coming day when disaster will strike the people who invade us. Even though fig tree have no blossoms, and there are no grapes on the vine, even though the olive crop fails, and the field lies empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields, and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will be joyful in the God of my salvation, the sovereign Lord is my strength, makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread on the heights. Let's pray. You are a great and wonderful
sinful God. And as we come before you, help us to not be embarrassed or afraid to ask you why things are like they are. Help us to accept your answers too, Father. But ask, we ask you, Lord, keep us safe and in your care. In Jesus' name.